Bill, if you want, thank you for checking out this special episode of Really Dicey. This is Manny, and I'm here with... Andy Peregrine, the writer on Regency Cthulhu. So it's a bit of a change from Dune for a change, which is... <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we're going to talk about Regency Cthulhu. Uh, Cthulhu during the time of the uh, very popular Jane Austen novels, using their, their setting and time. Um, uh, so yes, I'm really excited about this. I'm a, a big Jane Austen fan. Uh, I always felt that Jane Austen is one of those huge works that uh, almost rivals almost rivals Shakespeare when it comes to the influence it's had on literature. Um, so yeah, wh- why can you tell me about Richie Cthulhu? Okay, well, it's obviously everything you'd expect of a Jane Austen role-playing game, but with tentacles and horror and despicable, horrible things going on. Um, they're, they're very much the focus for me as a writer was producing a, a more of a Jane Austen. It's more about, you know, the, the balls and the social aspects of things as well as squamous horrors from beyond the stars as well um so it's that's the part that interests me about the regency i, I love the sort of you know the relationships and and romantic plots although i have to say it's it's one of my bugbears about jane austen is that she often gets held up as a as a romance writer and obviously there is romance in her books but i've interestingly i've always thought her actually very similar to terry pratchett the wonderfulness of Pratchett's work is usually all the little asides and the tweaks and the fiddles and, the, and those little extra subheadings that he does. And it's when they do televised versions of Terry Pratchett books, they never quite capture that feel. And it's, I think it's often similar with Jane Austen. When you read the novels themselves, there is such a, there is a, such a wit to it and a sarcasm and just subtle digs at society all the way through that you lose when you just do the story. The story just becomes a sort of romance. And actually, there is so much more uh, to what she does and, and the work that she's done, which is what really hooks you in when you watch it. So it's always my um, thing to say to people, if they've not actually read Jane Austen, probably don't know it as well as you think you have, because just seeing however good they are, um, TV ad- adaptations and the like, only gives you the story and not the whole story, if you like. Hmm. So that also certainly inspired my love of it. Um, when would this book be kind of like like recently we had some like Pride and Prejudice and Zombies and Sense Sensibilities and Sea Monsters? Uh, yes. Or is this are these adventures going to be kind of like adaptations in a way of Jane Austen works, or is it going to be just a, more of like setting piece, kind of like the the Berlin book and the Harlem Unbound uh, books? Yeah a lot more of a setting book and it it's kind of developed that way because the way this book came about is I went on a group holiday as I often do with friends of mine and we happened to be holidaying in what turned out to be a Regency house and as we're all gamers we all wanted to run some you know play something and the most obvious thing came to mind was playing some some Cthulhu which is often a great pickup and I've been sitting on this um, great store of Jane Austen uh, research that I've been doing so I thought we'll tell you what we're in a Regency house let's do a Jane Austen Cthulhu um, that was an adventure called the Long Corridor uh, also because which was inspired by an aspect of the house that we noticed where there were these two corridors that sat next to each other going to the same places and we suddenly realized oh the reason they've got these is because one of the corridors is for the ladies and gentlemen and one of the corridors is for the servants to use and it was always, I always find it interesting when architecture um, backs up social divisions in this weird, strange way. So that's where this adventure came to mind. And uh, so we played this one out. And unsurprisingly, as I got to know more of Chaosium, I said to them, is this adventure useful for you? I could do a thing. I did some notes on playing in the, the Regency to build the adventure and what we did with the characters. And it turns out Lynn Hardy is a huge Regency fan. So as soon as I suggested this to her, she was, oh, yes, yes, I, I want to get my teeth into this. She got very excited, which is great. So there's a moral in the story. Always try and excite the companies you're working with with what you want to do. And, um, and it originally was going to be just a sort of one-off scenario with some extra notes. But Lynn liked it so much, she said, well, actually, we're going to expand the notes. And actually, could you write us another scenario to go in that as well? And we'll t- t- turn it into a whole book. And from my original app manuscript, um, Lynn's added in loads of extra bits. She's you know, rebuilt another modern version of the town it's set in as well. Loads of extra stuff and bit pieces in there. So what you're going to end up with is a book with a solid detail on the history of the region, 
how it works, how society works. There are so many rules and, and etiquette, things that you need to follow, and uh, that Bridgerton doesn't. It's a whole other long conversation. Um, but, uh, and then you've got two full adventures that are designed to play almost like a mini campaign. They're set in the same town, which we also detail. So you've got a nice setting of a nice Ham Hampshire town village that you can uh, game in and all the characters and, and people that go with it. So you've got a lot of stuff to get your teeth into and to play both the adventures and even carry on beyond that as well. So there's loads of stuff to do there. Do you find this project um, uh, challenging? I, I can't imagine the, the tone of Lovecraft and tone of Austin is all very different from each other. So combining it together, was that, was that tricky? Um, not as tricky as it might, as you might've thought, because there are essentially one of the wonderful things about Cthulhu is you are taking um, a quite an ordinary time. Uh, and sometimes the more ordinary, the more mundane, the better. And then a horrible thing starts to invade it. So whether you're being Regency ladies or, 20, you know, 1920s bootleggers or the like, um, you're living your ordinary lives and then stuff starts happening. And I was, I'm always a big fan of creepy horror, things that start happening that are a little bit bizarre. So the, I don't think it's giving away too much, say in the long corridor in the first adventure, the oddity that happens is when you attend this ball, and so there's loads of stuff you can do with dancing and things like that, it? but you discover some of the younger folk of the ball have noticed that the servant's corridor and the, um, the residence corridor, despite ending in ex identical doors, one of them seems to be slightly longer than the other, only by like half a, half a foot at this point, but it's enough for them to notice, oh, if we pace it out in one corridor, it's slightly longer than we pace it out in the other one, but the doors are in the same place. And of course, at this point, they've just put it down to it being a weird architectural quirk. Maybe there's a curve they can't quite see or something like that. No one's really paying it any mind. But of course, as this is a Cthulhu adventure, the player characters start noticing this corridor is getting slightly longer and there's something else going on in this house. And it gradually draws you into the mystery of what's gone, which actually turns out to be a family legacy that's gone back uh, a good couple of hundred years. So that's Part of the, the joy I find with horror is that you, the setting that you're in, you can do so much with because you can enjoy that setting and you can enjoy Cthulhu in the same way and together. You know, they, they, it always fits well with wherever you go because the horror always just creeps in in the same way to almost every setting that you might use, as long mm -hmm. as you know. To... Oh, okay. Do you know if there's going to be... Um... Uh, any additional optional like rules or um, uh, something, anything extra for, for investigators? Well, th this is something I am unreasonably excited about because obviously one of the things I'm very excited about is this, for me, this is a, this is a big tick box in the Call of Cthulhu was the first game I ever played outside Dungeons and Dragons, I, you know, and I've loved it for a long time. So the idea that I've actually written a book for Chaosium for Cthulhu I am really, I'm really fanboying over. I'm really excited about this. So one of the things that also excited me was that we will do, there is a, there'll be a new, I believe, Regency style character sheet. And for some reason, I'm very excited that I've been responsible for creating a new character sheet for Cthulhu. I don't know why that excites me so much. Uh, but so this, I say, because we have new skills, there is a reputation system we've worked out. There are lots of little bits and pieces about how, the new rules of Cthulhu reflect what is going on in um, in the Regency, because you are we generally set your characters as what you would assume a Jane Austen character is. So the sort of the not middle class, but in the middle of the social um, social status thing. So the same sort of era as Jane Austen characters in terms of what they can do. But this is still where a place where etiquette is vitally important, you know, and a lot of things you will do in the game you will have to roll an etiquette role just to know how to talk to someone at a ball, how to ask someone to dance. How to, all of these things are often predicated by, do you know the right way to do this? So there are a lot of skills that or normally wouldn't be very important, but suddenly acquire massive importance in the Jane Austen world. And of course, all the usual tweaks and fiddles about terms of technology, you know, operate heavy machinery isn't quite so 
appropriate for a Jane Austen character and things like that. So there are all the usual mixtures of just generally shifting the time. But there are a load of, it is mostly we have looked at creating the world and giving you the setting and the background that you need. But there's a fair few new tweaks and fiddles for the rules. And of course, there's a complete how to create your characters system as part of that. So it does take you through all the details and, uh, and also creating your estate and the background of your character, which of course is very, very houses are just import, as important as romance partners in Jane Austen, it seems. So uh, that's, uh, that's a big part of, uh, of how you build the background for your character as well. Hmm. So do, by any chance, do you know the, like the, uh, the mechanical or, or technical aspects of the book itself? Do you know like how many pages it will be or what chapters? It will have or how many chapters? Um, I've I've got most of that because I have seen the PDF. Um, <laughs> it's essentially we've got a chapter on the setting. Uh, we've got a chapter. Oh, I think we have a whole. Then we have a whole chapter on the village. It all takes place in Tarryford, and then we have a chapter each for the two adventures that go with it. And I think that adds up to about two hundred page book or so. I think. Like slightly shorter. I would have to double check. I can't remember the actual page count. Um, but yeah, it's it's a solid bit of work, and it, it's it's certainly not a little sort of pamphlet with a couple of notes. You get a good, good, decent chapter on how to do the read, read and see if you've never even seen it. So if you say watch Bridgerton or you've half read one of the Jane Austen books when you were at school, then this is still the book for you. Um, as much as if you're really into Jane Austen, you'll also hopefully get a few new bits and pieces about the setting, the background, that will uh, help you expand your game from what you already know as well. What do you think is it about this this period of time um, in the early 1800s that, that really um, captures people's attentions? I think it's a mix. I think to a certain degree, it's it's mostly people have a love of Jane Austen and that brings them to the Regency. So it that's given it this era and suggestion that it was a vastly romantic era and that everyone was being, you know, there's always, we always like to imagine these, these the past as being you know, romantic and stylish and, and people are going for country walks and meeting the man of their dreams and then who comes out of rivers soaking wet for no readily apparent reason that isn't in the novel and, um, and little bits and pieces like, like that. So you've, of course, the reality of the Regency, like any historical era is a lot more, is a lot different, uh, but it's that it's in British history, it's, it's a slightly weird era because it, it fits in between things. It's got the same influence as a big era of like the Victorian era or the Georgian era. It's actually a tiny sliver of history. It's only about you know, 30, 40 years at, at most um, before, you know, between the Georgians and the, and the Victorians. To a certain degree as well, the thing that always annoys me, people act, often lump Jane Austen in with, as a Victorian writer when actually her posthumously published books were a, appeared were printed i think about 10 years before victoria took the throne so she's absolutely not victorian in any way shape or form but um but she sent, tends to get lumped in there as well so i think it's like anything a similar thing to the way we romanticize the victorian period and things and we'd, we'd like it is easier to focus on great wonderful stone buildings and a london and a sort of steam-powered london and horse-drawn carriage elegant dresses men in cool frock coats rather than the appalling abuses of, of civil rights and empire that are going on, the slavery that's happening, the, the oppression of the East India Company, that, you know, um, and the abuse of other nations that, be, that is going on by, you know, by the Victorian English throughout. So well, you can pick what you like from, from history. But there is also an element of um, the Regency has, it's the start of a lot of things. You're looking at the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. So it hasn't quite ruined um, towns of great black factory type you know, buildings throwing out smoke. But that is starting. You are seeing the building of new technology is starting to come in. You've also, of course, just from a role playing point of view, got the, um, got the Napoleonic Wars going on almost constantly throughout the era. So there's lots of fighting and action and adventure. And, uh, and this also leads you towards the issue of romance, which is actually quite, a, quite important, particularly for young women at the time when as a woman you had almost no rights whatsoever you didn't even own the clothes you were wearing they belonged to your husband or your father or whatever technically and when they are in the position where if they do not marry they have nothing 
And yet we've had all these wars. The young men have been mown down in their hundreds in all these wars. There's there's very little options for a woman in in it's it's quite desperate and difficult. This is why romance is such an important thing. They are they are not just looking for a lovely life partner. Women in this era are looking for some sort of security, or they won't be able to eat. In many cases, uh, they're left without you know the option for you know even a learning a trade to do. So there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on socially at this time. It's beginning and growing. Think for what will become the Victorian era, and the from a, at least a role playing perspective, uh, the the rules of society and this careful stepping that you have to do of. of who is allowed to do what is uh, is very interesting to navigate. Uh, I'm sure it was a lot worse to live through, but it was as a role player it's, to navigate because you have this. Um, there are oh, that's the point. there are so many oddities to the social rules and how they work that you've got so much you can play around with, and and you need to learn how to approach things. About it. So it's almost like a whole whole new setting going on. And this is mainly because it's at a time when the middle class is beginning to develop itself. So there isn't really, sometimes Jane Austen characters get considered middle class and really they're not. They're the lower end of the upper class. And there is a vast gulf between the poor, of which are about 94% of the countryside and the top 6% that are the Jane Austen. The 1% is still the 1%. But um, they are terrified as they see this new merchant class rising up that these new people who, who aren't actually part of the gentry are getting into all their parties because they've got all the money, but they've earned it through what they call trade. So all of this social, these social rules have been designed to keep those people out so that they can keep, you know, circle the wagons literally and try and preserve their sort of position at the bottom of the aristocracy. So you've got an element of desperation and, and outright social warfare going on in the Regency that will get resolved by eventually the middle class is going to win. They're going to get it. When you reach the uh, Victorian era, there are three distinct classes. You know, there are the aristocracy, the businessmen of the middle class and the, and the working class. Of the, of the, and you know, that's well established in very little extra time. Uh, but this is the time that the gentry are trying to fight for their position. And it's and it's quite vicious. You know, they are using every trick they can to keep out these interlopers um, who are wealthier than they are for the most part. So there's so much, you know, there is social combat, there is physical combat going on with the, with the Napoleon Wars, there is romance, there is, you know, it's got everything in it. Mm. So when this book comes out, and if I was running it, uh, what character would you make for, for this? Oh, there's so many. I, I tend to get to, it's very easy to draw quickly from the, um, from the Jane Austen novels. So you want to play, you know, Elizabeth Bennett's or, you know, uh, Marianne Dashwood's and what have you. Um, it is what I find most interesting in creating, and it does come with pre gen characters, this one, is I find what's most interesting is creating connections between the characters rather than the characters themselves. So we have in this, for instance, we've got an older and a younger sister in the pre-gen characters. And they're, you know, one of them is a little sort of more bookish older sister who hasn't been so interested in society. And the younger one is, you know, desperate to get out there and do the balls and, and get married and, and things like this. And there's always the interesting connection between the two of one of them is sort of being phased out because he was sort of considered an old maid of like, yeah, mid twenties, <laughs> which is ridiculous. And, um, and, you know, there is, so there is a difference between them, you know, the younger sister who wants to, wants to be doing the romance, the older sister who's kind of given up on it, and the, the pressure between the two of them. And, and of course, then you put, uh, put male characters in there who are also, in some cases, being hunted for romance. And some of them might be going, you know what, I don't think I will, uh, because they've got the option. And your characters will come back, in fact, to their parents, they say, you know, bum, yeah, it's, it's the end of the world. And she goes, yes, but... How are you and Captain Phillips getting on? Is that that's not important. <laughs> I, I, I think you'll find it is. Yeah, a young lady's future is very important. The world's going to end. Well, not until lunchtime or until the Parkinson's ball. I think you'll find. You know, so you know, always got people have different priorities in that here. But yes, there is. Uh, so for me, it's the relationships between the characters, and I found it quite interesting. We have one of the characters 
Uh, I didn't specify sexuality for the characters that happens, but one of the characters who is a um, military officer, uh, both times it's been played, the, the players decided their character was gay, uh, which of course is perfectly fine. In the, so it's been quite entertaining that when this dashing officer, um, in this case, swept up at the ball, you know, jumped off his horse and went sort of stalking into the ball. Uh, and I, I, I'm a big fan of making people roll things like style rolls, you know, and it has all the ladies going, God, did you see that? All right, he's come back, has he? And of course, and plenty, there was lots of romance and people trying to say, oh, yes, do you want to come and, you know, escort me, Captain? And all of them realising none of them getting anywhere because he's actually far more interested in the, in the gentleman poet that's also turned up. <laughs> so, so there are plenty of things. It's those connections and how they relate to the society and expectations that really make pretty much any character blossom. And it, to a certain degree, it's quite nice to have characters that aren't too exciting. And this is what Cthulhu does very well. You can have quite ordinary people. And it's the position and the situation they're in and the connections they make is what really makes the interesting game. Mm. Is there anything about this that I haven't asked you about that you want to share that uh, any, any extra details? Oh, but, uh, I could go on about Bridgerton, but that's a whole other. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, obviously that's one of the, one of the things that's brought us towards this one. I think uh, one of the things that pushed it forward to Bridgerton has been so popular, but I must admit as a, as a Jane Austen fan, I spent, to be fair, addicted to British. I watched every episode and binged it all, um, but spent also a lot of my time shouting at the television. <laughs> so so the things, season two was so much better. Unpopular opinion, I know. But um, but yeah, and it, it's those. So yeah, we've got a lot of really good things. But I'm really pleased with the book. Um, I, I'm very glad that Chaosium wanted to take it on and do more stuff with it because it's, it's one of those things where you have a lot of Jane Austen stuff burning away and you want to write it out and get it out there. And it's always great when you come across a company that says, oh, we love this. And I know Lynn jumped into it with both feet going, well, yeah, and I can do some more stuff. She's really added loads of really good stuff to it as well. So you've got not only that, but the other one I should add is, is and this is Lynn's work where we have the Regency town of Tarraford. Um, Lynn's also added an updated version of that town so if you want to play or if you enjoy that setting, you can do it in the 1920s as well with, uh, with your ordinary Cthulhu characters. So there's even stuff, for if you never touch the Regency, you can still get some use out of this book, which I always find interesting. But uh, yeah, there's, there's plenty to dive into. We want to give you something to give you a really solid, you can play it as a like, mini campaign um, and just enjoy a, a really good dive into the world of Jane Austen. Or you can, um, and you can then, take it onto your own, you can run a whole campaigns from this if you like, or you can move on to another era uh, and pick up some more great Cthulhu stuff from there otherwise. But, yeah. but I think I think people are going to enjoy it. I, I, was, I really enjoyed writing it. It just sort of burned straight out, so it was great. Hmm. Excellent. Um, when will this PDF be out? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and they, I, you know, I'm, I'm way outside the thing. I think quite soon. I have seen, I have seen a, an almost final PDF. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it must have been on the cards. But obviously, I'm not privy to what um, Chaosium have got going on. They've also got Rivers of London. Obviously, is, um, is really, you know, taking a lot of their time for things. So uh, where my game fits in, I, I'm not quite sure on. But mm. I don't think they would have said coming soon if it wasn't coming reasonably soon. Um, it's been, we've been have, we've had this on the on the go for a little while, and uh, so I think it, it's going to be on the on the cards pretty swiftly. But, uh, <laughs> I wish I, I wish we could give you a date because I want I want to see the final copy. I'm very excited. Yeah. <laughs> same here, same here. Um, uh, so viewers, I would I will put a link in the description once it comes out officially. Um, mm. Andrew, thank you so much for taking time to talk to us again. Always a uh, 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 I always love our discussions about all things gaming. Um, yeah. No, me yeah. too. And it's nice to, I mean, I love Dune, but it's nice to talk something other than Dune for a change. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, uh, everyone out there, uh, thank you so much for taking time to watch this video. Please like and subscribe. Let us know what you think of the video in the comments below. Um, and uh, yeah, take care. Be safe out there.